Now, as one enters a bigger possibility field, one is capable of having more pain or more well-being than in a smaller possibility field. And you can just think of a thimble of gasoline. A thimble of gasoline cannot kill you if you set it on fire. It's relatively small relative to you. So we're looking at just this little mathematical equation. Some of these details I'm getting a little bit lost in. Um, I, th I think I get the general idea. Well, anyway, thimble full, you're not going to burn yourself alive if you spill it on you and set it on fire. So you've got lower pos possibility of pain with a thimble of gasoline than you do uh, with a tanker of gasoline. On the other hand, a thimble of gasoline is not going to get you far in a car. And so when, when you have a tanker of gasoline, you can blow up a neighborhood. You can burn a, fi a, you know, a neighborhood down. But you can also fuel everyone in the city to come to the park and have a celebration, so to speak. So mathematically speaking, it's neutral, but it's a higher possibility field. So um, the, it's more fun. Well, let's, because it's neutral, because it's neutral, when, 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 when a neutral possibility field interacts with competency, you get exponentially more well-being and pleasure. When a neutral possibility field interacts with incompetency or self-hatred, you get an exponentially larger amount of pain. And so um, we, we don't like opportunities. I mean, like you and I, wouldn't like to be suddenly plopped into a NASCAR uh, in mid-race right now. Because the speed and the velocity of that possibility field mean I'm almost certainly at 200 miles an hour going to hit a curb or hit another car because I don't have the competency. And so that's why, you know, the, the first level of the game is self-love and self-transcendence. The adult <clears throat> the adult loves the child, loves the adolescent, loves the young adult, loves the full face of the archetype unconditionally. And in doing so, touches the transcendent brain, which opens the awareness. You see, the, the transcendent brain is the key to awareness of our connection, our interconnection, our nesting within a larger paradigm, within a larger fractal representation, a larger probability field. We don't get to see that we're playing in that large field until we've earned the right by touching the transcendent region of the brain. By definition, see, because the brain in these various levels, so you've kind of lost me. Um, are we still on the game? Um, you know, what, 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 are, what are you, you know, what, what's, where are we at in this, in this conversation? Well, you asked what the game is, and the game has, you know, various different levels. So on the one hand, I'm, I'm saying the game is about self-love and moving from child, which is self-centered love, adolescent, which is self-centered love, young adult, which is self-centered love, to adult love, which is how can I love that which is in me? How can I love and understand? How can I meet the needs, the survival, the security, the love and belonging, the self-esteem of these different parts of me? And so this is level one in the game, to learn to master 
create the creation through the transcendence of time because if you think of rings of a tree I'm talking about inner ages right now if you think of rings of the tree level the first tree you know ring of the tree is at the at the center of a 2000 year old redwood it never disappears the record of that first ye first year is there um, and so as we grow older as we become adults not grown-ups grown-ups grown still hate themselves and are in dominance dynamics with with the psyche but as we become adults as we become adults we become able to give to our inner child, to give to our adolescent, to give to our, uh, uh, to give to our young adults, to the various faces of self, everything that they that they need to feel su surviving, safe, secure, to meet their human needs, basically. Now. The definition of an environment that is highly empathic is an environment in which all the interfaces of self feel loved, protected, and safe. This inner creation of the fulfillment of human needs by the adult in the inner world, so we're dealing with going back to traumatic childhood events and healing the trauma. We're going back to adolescent events and forgiving them for not knowing what the fuck they were doing in an emotionally illiterate cult. We're going back to the young adult who's frantically terrified of being shamed for not knowing stuff and of course knows absolutely nothing. And we're honoring them, we're giving them significance in the inner world. And in the doing, the child, the adolescent, feel fulfilled, and they release the consciousness from the reptilian brain stem and the limbic brain up into the empathic level. When we have a sustainable adult capable, capable of generating, capable of generating self-love from the inside, we now reach into the, the need to be a part of something greater than ourselves. And in a low trauma environment, you know, buffered by this, this inner state, we touch the endogenous DMT inside the brain. Endogenous just means that uh, we have transcendent chemicals within our biology that we will not access until we are capable of being responsible for the knowledge. Because if you're in a sociopathic state and you realize you're connected to everyone, then you go out and try and use that to hurt more. And now you're entering a larger probability field where you can do more damage. And so it's not a good, you know, it's, 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 it's counterproductive for the game, which is all about the ultimate amount of fun. So it's more fun to play a complex game competently than tic-tac-toe. Otherwise, we'd all be playing tic-tac-toe for the rest of our, our lives. We like something more complex. And so what, what, we're, what we're looking at is a paradigm in which the feeling of love is actualized with competency. The masculine and feminine pole are the same. You do not love unless you love enough to see. Well, actually, to love enough to care. You do not love unless you love enough to care. You do not care if you don't care enough to see. It's always held by the place in front. You don't see if you don't see enough to understand. You don't understand if you don't understand enough to empathize when you walk a mile in someone's shoes. The message is, if you really knew me, you would understand and empathize with everything about me because you would see, you would understand. So you see enough 
to understand. You understand enough to empathize. You empathize enough to change course, to attune, to adjust. And you adjust enough to bring well-being. So when you're looking at what, why are you attuning and what is, your, what is your goal in attuning, why are you attuning, etc. When you attune to someone out of love, your goal is to help them realize their potential. If they don't have a house to sleep in, to love someone is to facilitate their survival and then teach them to facilitate their own survival, which is a higher form of love because now they're free. Now you've introduced freedom from dependency. It's a more complex variable. When someone is surviving but insecure, you attune in such a way that their security blossoms. If they are lonely and isolated, you love them enough to form a home for the part in them that is isolated, that is alone, that is unwelcome, that is unempathized with, by giving empathy, by giving understanding. So you help and you attune to facilitate the development of another human being's human needs. This is competent adult love. When you attune enough to facilitate the self-realization of another human being, gratitude, safety, trust, joy, pleasure, and abundance are the natural byproducts of that alchemy. When someone experiences the spontaneous alchemy of gratitude, of joy, of pleasure, of abundance, of safety, and associates you as a trustworthy and stable part of that equation, that alchemy produces love. You have loved enough to become competent at loving, and the byproduct is more love. And the byproduct is a transcendent state that is shared, a transcendent state that is now shared. Because now you're self-realized with your adult loving yourself and touching the transcendent state, which leads you to love another. And if you're competent in your love, they now feel love for you and for themselves. Because every adult loves themselves. And the adult is the one who self-realizes the potential. So the love is reciprocated at a transcendent level, at a transcendent level. Because the dedication, one could say the sacrifice, but at that level it is not sacrifice. One could say the sacrifice to take my time to study you and learn about you and care about you. One could say the sacrifice. But that's from the reptilian perspective. When you're dealing with a high degree of, of self-love and competency, the greatest joy is to be around other adults, which means other human beings who are self-realized who love themselves. The need for love and belonging never goes away. Who do you want to belong to? A sociopath? who has no chance of ever stopping hating themselves? Or do you want to belong to someone who is constantly realizing their gifts and bringing them into the world? That is a joy. I didn't think of that. I didn't think of that. That's a joy. We're dealing at a very high level of joy 
it's more fun to be around a self-actualized human being than it is to be around a sociopathic human being or a limbic human being or a timidly empathic and partly sociopathic human being, you know, where, where, which is where most of us are at. So it's more fun. You cannot sustain joy and healing in a transcendent state while, while being around other miserable people who are not self-actualized and who don't know how to become self-actualized. It's not that much fun. The greatest fun is to start engaging with the other, to start participating in a field that is only vaguely liminally aware that is only realized when everyone in the field reaches that state. When everyone in the field reaches a transcendent state, it is an order of magnitude more significant than if 99% of people reach that state. So explain that logic. Why is that last 1% so vital? What, you know, because, you know, what, why wouldn't it just be 1% more, uh, you know, more, more significant to go from 99% to 100%? Well, think of it this way. You've got 100, or let's say you've got 99 chanting monks. You've got 99 chanting monks, Om Mi Patni Hom, Om Mi Patni Hom, whatever. So they're off chanting, right? And what are they trying to do? Just like every other human being on the planet, they're trying to feel sustainably good and not feel sustainably bad. Um, they're trying to contribute, you know, be part of something bigger than themselves, all that. So they're, they're, they're doing that. And some of them are succeeding, whatever. But anyway, they're all chanting there. And the hundredth person gets out a gun and shoots out the ceiling of the temple and says, fuck this rice, I'm not begging, you know, da da da, you know, da da da. You, you know, I'm not taking orders from anyone. Anyone want to argue with me, I'm going to kill him. And one person tries to argue, they kill him. Uh, you know, the other person, they back off. Now, what's happened to the state of those 99 monks? They've all crashed down into the reptilian state. They're all terrified because the environment is sociopathic. And the reason the reptilian brain exists is to help the body survive in a reptilian state, in a sociopathic environment. So because of the hierarchy of human needs, the first one being survival, if you are surrounded by reptiles, or if there is one reptile, if we go to another example, you're swimming in the water, beautiful vista, magnificent trees, meadows, wildflowers, you're bathing in the river, feel so wonderful on your naked body, and in the corner of your eye, you see a water snake wriggling in your direction. The body through you know, millions of years of neuronal linking, understands that that snake is a threat to their survival. Now, 99% of everything going on is pristine. It's beautiful. Snake's only six inches long. You're looking at miles of vista. This is nothing. Why does the body enter a reptilian state in that situation? Because that one thing has the neurological link to taking all of it away in an instant in a painful death of snake poisoning. 
Now, one could even say that 99% of the time, if you stand still, that 1% of your awareness won't even kill you. And that even if it's a toxic snake, 99% of the time it would move past you. And 99% of the snakes are not toxic. It doesn't matter. So you're dealing with 1% of 1% of 1% probability field. That if you just do nothing, it'll all be fine. But the body goes rigid. In an instant, the reptilian brain is looking for, do I run? Do I hit the snake? Do I freeze and let the snake go by? But I'm in a reptilian state. So why is that a problem for the game of well-being? Well, being in a reptilian state isn't fun. Helplessly dying isn't fun. It's not self-loving, nor is it masterful. It doesn't feel good. It's also incompetent. And so this is why you have an order of magnitude of impact as you go from 1% of 1% to 1% to the last thing. Meaning, when a human being can be raised on this planet and go through an entire lifespan without ever encountering another human being who knowingly and intentionally killed another human being, when a child can go from cradle to grave without e even being in the history books. Because the level of consciousness is such that the love and the competency is such that it is not necessary. Because we care for our innocents and we care for our youngs such that by the time they're two years old, they've freed themselves from their reptilian brainstem because they've had nurturing, attuned parents leading them out into a world that functions at a rhythm and scale that does not elicit constant terror in the part of the infant. You see, now that child is moving up to a luminous state. When you understand that a few drops of arsenic in a delicious glass of organic orange juice is the thing that kills the body. 99% of it was great. Nice orange color, clean glass, freshly squeezed organic orange juice. It's just that little bit of arsenic that finishes you off. Or that little bit of LSD that you didn't know was in there and you drive into another car because you didn't know. It's everything. So that's where the order of magnitude uh, is coming from. Well, I'm starting to get a little bit tired. How about a little bit of that orange juice? It's fine with me. Is this the kind of conversation you want to have? It feels great. Let's share a hug. Let's bring this into the body. There's just words and stuff. The point is to open the possibility field. All right. Well, that's it for now. So, we're 20% in to this conversation. We're 20% in to one of the most important conversations I've had in this lifetime. It's a conversation in which I'm learning. It's a conversation in which I'm experiencing geometric reality intersecting with mental reality, intersecting with biological reality. It is a conversation that is teaching me that is expanding me into places that I'm anxious to go. 
I can't wait to get back in the arena. And I'm grateful that this technology exists to create a microculture inside the psyche that I've never met without. Be well.